Hey, it's Sammy for another episode of the I Do Music Podcast. And our goal and our mission is to empower and educate musicians and artists worldwide. And on today's episode, we're talking to multi-platinum producer Teddy Bishop on the elements of creating a classic record, having great music mentors, and his venture into film scoring. Hey everybody, it's Sammy with the I Do Music Podcast, and I'm sitting down here with multi-platinum producer, filmmaker, film editor, mm-hmm. <laughs> Teddy Bishop. What's up? Film score. Film score. But yeah. you edit as well. I do edits too. Yeah. 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 That's dope. I ran across your Vimeo recently, and we'll get into that. Okay, no doubt. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So um, you're from Detroit. We were talking about that a little bit off the record, mm-hmm. and um, I'm sure... You, you've been in Atlanta for a long time, so I'm sure Atlanta has influenced you in some way creatively. But as a Detroit native, can you tell me, I guess, how your hometown has influenced or inspired you um, and influenced your sound specifically? Sure. Um, Detroit has inspired me because, um, of course, everybody knows that Detroit is a musical town. When you go back to the 60s, you know, you got Motown and all that stuff that came out of Detroit. So. You know, Motown was a thriving music business in, the, I would say, the 60s and 70s until, you know, Motown started to, you know, move out to California. Mm-hmm. But nevertheless, by me growing up in Detroit and being around it, I, I literally lived not too far from Motown um, records where they cut all the stuff where you had Diana Ross, the Jacksons, all that stuff. And I was a young guy. Right. So my family, I had people in my family were very into music and they would take me around there. And I got inspired by just looking at all that. And... um Michael Jackson was like a big influence on me in my life as mm-hmm. a young man. You know what I mean? Definitely. So, um, yeah, but Detroit is a musical town. I think it still is. It just doesn't have the outlets that your California or your New York or your Atlanta have. So, gotcha. so yeah, gotcha. it's very influenced. Let's talk about a little bit about grow, um, you growing up and where the music, I guess, part of it. Because I mean, you've let's for those that don't know who Teddy Bishop is uh he's worked with a number of artists some of my favorites from Whitney Houston to Genuine Tony Braxton uh, and the list goes on and we'll get into that but mm-hmm. um you seem to be very um musical and I don't know if you started playing instruments first or like where that foundation may have came or come from church Church, you know, a lot that's of, always the best. Yeah, yeah the best a, producers come. From a lot there. of best producers, a lot of the best um, musicians come mm-hmm. out of church. I played drums in church, oh, okay. but I didn't get into playing the piano till I was probably fifteen. So mm-hmm. I started late playing piano, but I taught myself how to p- play piano because I wanted to stretch myself as being a producer. Gotcha. I already I always knew that I wanted to produce music some type of way as a young guy. So being in church helped me to kind of that was like the catalyst for me to to get into my career. Um, being around bands and stuff like that, mm-hmm. you know, just the, the typical stuff that a person does when they're influenced or inspired to be into the music business. That's dope. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so you self, you're a self-taught musician. Yes. How challenging was that at 15 to learn you know, and to sit down and say, you know, be disciplined because piano is very hard. And I'm too. glad you said that because like, like, a lot of my friends, while they were out going to parties and things like that, I would be just sitting in my room, you know what I mean, just coming up with coming up with music. Uh, I had friends that were already in the music industry, so mm-hmm. that was a blessing for me. Mm-hmm. So I was watching them being on, you know, out on tour. Uh, that's back in the day when you when you go watch uh, Albie Shore, New Edition, all that kind of stuff, mm-hmm. you know what I mean, on the road. Um, so they were on the road with them, so that was an influence for me just to sit in my room and just to learn music. So can you recall the first time you ever had a love for music? Like you were like, okay, this is, because you said early on you knew that you wanted to do something but can you recall that one moment um, as a child that you're like, I want to do this forever? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I can. And, and, and again, you know, it goes way back. It reveals how old I am. But I was watching the Jacksons. You know what I mean? Michael Jackson was a big influence on me. Just the, the moment I saw him um, perform on television when I was young, that just made me want to just be in, in, the music, in the music game. You never wanted to be the artist, though. Or did you? At one point, I did. I did. I, I used to. I used to sing, you know, and dance. And I think those things, singing and dancing, being young, actually helped me to cultivate to be a producer. Because, you know, to the, to be a producer, you got to be. I I think you need to know how to sing notes and things, so I can tell the artist what to do. Right. You know right. what I mean. But so. well, let's talk about what a producer is, in your opinion, or what the role of the producer is, because a lot of times, especially in 2017, mm-hmm. um, you know, it's like 
make the beat, send mm-hmm. over a, a collection of beats, and then it's not not saying that that's wrong, but mm-hmm. what in your opinion or how have you been uh, acting as the, in the role of a producer? Um, to, I think today's producer is different from the produ- pr- type of production that I come from, but I admire it. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, I look at some of the younger producers today and I actually learn from them. I study it because I don't ever want to be out of touch with music. Mm-hmm. But nevertheless, I do feel like producing has been watered down, mm-hmm. especially when it comes to producing vocals. So I feel like a person, no disrespect to it, because I, I, I treat myself the same way. If I'm sitting in front of the keyboard and... and, and Whatever I'm using, whether it be Logic, Fruity Loops, or whatever I'm using, I'm just a I'm just a beat maker at that point. But you're a real producer when you sit behind that board and and, and be able to articulate and tell the artist what to do and what not to do. Because a lot of the artists don't even really believe in themselves. You got to pull things out of them. Mm-hmm. And I think that's when you're a producer like that, you're basically the captain of the ship. Mm-hmm. Um, the day I, you know, when I was coming up as a producer. You know, the producers was the, the title of a producer was a little different because you were in charge of the budget and all that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? I think that that paradigm has changed a little bit, but um, I, don't, I don't have nothing wrong with it. I think music has evolved, mm-hmm. and I think it's good. Um, yeah. I think something. I think some music need to be changed lyrically, mm-hmm. but that's just my opinion. Um, but I, I listen to a lot of music. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure. I'm mm-hmm. sure you do. Mm-hmm. Uh, I wanted to ask because you said you mentioned sitting behind the board, and I right. know that you did go to school to um, learn how to engineer, mm-hmm. right? How beneficial was that for you as a producer to be able to engineer? Um, I guess the session in general. I think it's very beneficial to any producer to to know how to engineer their own um, their own content because you're 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 with it from conception, so therefore you you start developing your own sound. You know, when you have other, you know, when you have other mix engineers mixing your record, that's good. And you know, I've become successful from that. Mm-hmm. But I also noticed when I start mixing my own records, I start incorporating my own sound. Because right. you know how to EQ your own stuff, right. and that becomes your sound, i.e. your Timberlands, your Pharrells, exactly. your, all these people who came up with these sounds. That's, it's not just the records of what they wrote. It's the sonics. Exactly. So when you hear it on the radio, you can say, oh, that's, that's, that's a Timberland. Oh, that's or a whatever. Daddy Bishop. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, also, um, another thing that sparked I guess in my mind when you mentioned uh, pulling from the artist mm-hmm. and being able to work with the artist um, you even dive or you've dived into I guess manage, managing artists as well do you feel like that skill on the producer side helped you become like a manager and being able to pull from the artist there absolutely I think I think when you, you, you when you delve into something so much you start to become a professional at that particular thing so um me, you know, producers, we're we're, we're like artists anyway. Right, so definitely. so when we have someone managing us, uh, we kind of learn the traits and tricks on how to manage. And mm-hmm. then you become wise at what you're doing. So now you can pass that information down to somebody else and, and teach them how to avoid the pitfalls of the industry. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Mm-hmm. So let's talk about the record Torn by LaToya Luckett. Um, mm-hmm. This is near and dear to my heart because it was the first ballad that I learned in marching band. Oh, wow. At the tender age of like wherever you are in seventh grade. Okay. Um, so you're known for your ballads mm-hmm. from many notable artists, um, some of the most notable artists of all time, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. What artists have inspired uh, the music you produce? I know you mentioned Michael Jackson, the Jacksons. Mm-hmm. Um, you even said Diana Ross. But like, mm-hmm. if you could think of maybe your top five that may have been inspired or influenced that music. Um, you know, and I mentioned those people like you, 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 the Jacksons and, and, and those people that came out of Motown. That was young for me. But as I as I evolved and music got older, the people who inspired me musically were people like Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis um, from a production side. Mm-hmm. Uh, the guys who actually put me in the business, L.A. Reid and Babyface, those right. guys inspired me. Artist-wise, I would say people like... Um, um, you know, Aaliyah, when I worked with her, you know what I mean? I was very I was very inspired by her sound. Um, when I worked with um, Whitney and, and, you know, those people, these are people that I wanted to work with growing up, and I eventually ended up working with them. So mm-hmm. I would listen to all that music. I always had success with women for some strange reason. I don't know what that is. Because you can make great balance. Yeah, I was all right. But, and that's one thing, you know, and, and you know, 
I made great ballads, but a lot of times that that was the one thing that people thought that that's all, all I could, you could do. do. Right. You know what I mean? Right. And and and, and that kind of started being a stigma on me a little bit. Gotcha. Um, he goes, oh, let's get Teddy Bishop. He can come up with a ballad. No, I know how to come up with up temples too. Yeah. You know yeah. what I mean? But yeah. that's what happens in the music industry. But I just I just stayed in my lane. You know what I mean? So, but it, you know, going back to your question, I, I've been influenced by a lot of artists that I've worked with. Um, Man, if I had a name, it would be a lot. It would be a lot. Yeah. It's okay. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask you, I guess, moving from when you, uh, those specific songs that you were making, like A Torn by Latoya Luckett or I Miss You, Aaliyah, mm -hmm. um, where do you feel R&B has since transformed um, from those some of your earlier records? Like, you know, we have artists. R&B artists like Black, SZA, Daniel Caesar now, mm -hmm. right? And yeah. R&B is just definitely transformed. What are your thoughts on today? Like I said earlier, I love what's going on today. I listen to SZA. I listen to Bryson Tiller. I love Chris Brown's new album. I listen to that R&B. You, you got through that 45 track album? Oh yeah, you yeah. Did? Oh yeah, no I, doubt. I, I haven't gotten through it. Yet. I thought it was only thirty records on there. I, I Talk heard about it was Chris like 40. album, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, I must be missing some records. The deluxe, there. you gotta get it. <laughs> yeah, I must be. Rich. But 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 well, you know what's crazy? So by me being a musician, when I listen to that music, all they're doing is taking the music that I grew up on. When I play the chords, I'm like, this is what Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis used to do. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Or this is what some of those producers that I grew up on. All they're doing is taking that music and changing it sonically. Yeah. That's, that's what's true. happening. That's true. So, but I, that's why I like it. Yeah. Some producers my age may say, "Oh, that's not music." Yes, it is. I don't care what you say. It's music and mm -hmm. it's selling. People like it. You just gotta evolve. Yeah. You know what I mean? I mean, the, the, like you said, the context of some of the music is different for sure. But I think there are a lot of there's a space for R and B still. I think that Absolutely. we were missing maybe like a couple years ago. Mm -hmm. Um. That's that's awesome. I'm happy that you do enjoy it still. And are there any of the newer artists artists that you may want to work with or mm -hmm. you, you look interested one. SZA 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 I like pop music a lot I want to work with uh, I would love to work with um, Nick Jonas mm -hmm. um, um, I like Nick Jonas Bryson Tiller mm -hmm. um, 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 Tory Lanez mm -hmm. like I like what they're doing mm -hmm. yeah definitely do. different definitely mm -hmm. different so um, I want to talk about your transition to Atlanta and why you chose to come down to Atlanta. It seemed kind of abrupt when I was reading into your story and what, what you've done um, over the years. Mm -hmm. But you've been down here for 27 years, you said, or yeah. so. So that's, you've settled in Atlanta. Why did you feel that was important at that time in your life? To come to Atlanta? Mm -hmm. um, well, you know, I, 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 I felt I was going to either move to New York mm -hmm. or California. Gotcha. But I had friends here for one, so that was a blessing for me. So that was kind of like a foundation for me. They were going to school, like, you know, Morehouse, Spellman, all that kind of stuff. I had a lot of friends here. But I saw the music industry growing. So in that time, that was like, that was 91, I think it was. Mm -hmm. um, at that time, you had, uh, you know, LaFace Records here. They were thriving. LA and Babyface opened up that. So and I was one of the first producers that they signed to that, right. to that, to that entity. So music was like it was like virgin territory here you know what i mean so it was it was a very good move because i came when when things you know when you get in on the ground floor of things and help build it you know you you're able to prosper from that absolutely so that helped me well, a lot well talk about some of your music mentors like um LA Reed and Babyface mm -hmm. um even Chris Hicks at Noontime mm -hmm. i know that's somebody that you work closely with yes tell us about uh how influential they were in in your start Okay. Um, going back to L.A. and Face, I, I was listening to them before I even met them. Mm -hmm. So I would just, you know, it's funny to me, like nowadays it's hard to find the credits on who worked on an album. Yeah. Then I can just flip it around and say, oh, they produced this. Right. Um, so I will always study their music. I always study Jimmy Jimmy and Terry, Teddy Riley at that particular time. Mm -hmm. But when I moved when I moved here um, and hooked up with L.A. and Face, uh, I learned a lot from them. A lot. But when I transitioned from them, I met a guy, Chris Hicks, as you spoke about, and Chris became my manager. And what I liked about that situation is that they were also starting off in the industry. So we were all growing together, myself, Brian Michael Cox at the time, um, Jazzy Faye. We were all growing at the same time, and it was a, it was a great relationship. And mm -hmm. we learned from each other. Mm -hmm. You know, We had good energy and synergy with each other at that time. And um, Chris was one of those managers, um, really good guy. Love Chris to death. That's my man. He 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 kind of uh, cultivated my 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 ear 
to the point where as a producer, sometimes I would come up with music, he'll come in the room and say, you should take this out, you should take this out, you know, because sometimes producers, we overproduce and we need somebody to tell us, just do it, do it this way, this mm -hmm. way. So he was that to me. That's awesome. Great relationship. How, what was your relationship to noon times? Same thing. Same. Yeah, I mean, Chris, you know, was at that time, you know, you had Chris, you had a guy, Ryan Glover, you had Nooney. And they all served their purpose with different producers. Gotcha. You know, um, Nooney was very close with Jazzy. Chris was very close with me and Brian. Gotcha. So it was that type of relationship. Nice. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned Brian Michael Cox. And I know you have um, a few other people that you songwrite with or mm -hmm. you have in the past. So talk about being, I guess how you said overall as a producer but then also being able to contribute on the songwriting side and how like that is important I think for creating a, a hit record at least or a classic um if I'm understanding your question right you mean as far as collaboration is collaboration concerned? too yes I want to talk I guess I want you to talk about who you've worked with in terms of songwriting with other people okay. but then also the songwriting aspect because a lot of producers maybe don't write they do like I said they might mm -hmm. excuse me they might uh, just send over a beat to someone and just, that that's the way it is and maybe tell them like hey Maybe you could do it this way, but you on the other hand have actually been involved in the writing process, mm -hmm. which I think is different um, in, in, You know sometime in my, in, in my in my career I, It was one of those things where you send a, a mp3 to somebody they write to it sitting back But I noticed that, that those were never my best records gotcha. My best records were when I got into the studio with the artist or with the producer or writer that I was collaborating I.e. John Tay Austin at the time John Garrett, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, this guy named JQ from the Clutch at the time, um, Kerry Hilson, all these people. We mm -hmm. were we were writing a lot of records at the time. Those were the right go to writers that Noontime would go to. Oh, okay. I might be leaving out some, but nevertheless, I'm just miss mentioning the people that I can think of mm -hmm. right away. And that process allowed us. Um, we basically would say, "Hey, send the artist to us. We not we're not going to send no MP3 because that's not that's not the organic way." I think you can come up with a hit record, obviously, for an artist, but when you have that artist in the studio with you, and I'm seeing a lot of producers do that today. Mm -hmm. They're making sure that they get at the artist. You right, know what I mean? Right. I think that's important. You get that energy with each other. Do you feel like you have to have a certain connection or be connected to an artist or a project in order to create a classic record? Mm -hmm. I think and, and even if you're not, let's just hypothetically say worst case scenario that you don't even like the artist. You got to put yourself in a situation where you kind of morph yourself into understanding where this artist is trying to come from, what mm -hmm. they want to talk about, what their past is, what their future is going to be, and you write about that. Mm. Yeah. True. So, uh, quote stop waiting on god to make your dreams a reality while you sit back and wait for it to happen make the first move then you'll see the power of god that was a quote you wrote mm -hmm. um, that i found on your twitter mm -hmm. <laughs> how did you make the first move to make your dreams a reality is my question just do it you know just just do it um just you gotta do it just go out and just try to try to solicit solicitate yourself as much as you can um let people know what you do uh, and, and be be so good that people can deny you, mm -hmm. you know. And I'm not tooting my horn, but I believe I was that, and I believe I'm still that. I think I'm really good at what I do. Absolutely. And I think that if you're good at what you do, people will gravitate to you. I agree. Mm -hmm. So you've even, um, I think what a lot of producers dream of is to get their music and to film and TV, mm -hmm. uh, you're a part of some classics as usual. We mm -hmm. talked about all the classic records, but uh, you've been a part of some timeless music and the movies. Mm -hmm. How did the placement in Friday come about? I gotta ask you, cause I had no idea that was. Yeah, my discography is funny because a lot of people, I've always been one of those under the radar type of producers. Definitely. Yeah, but um, Fridays, I forgot how that came about. I just think it was one of those things that I just had the particular record for that artist and mm -hmm. it happened to, happened to be something that worked for that project at the time. So was it like that the production or like Friday, the movie, like whoever's working on the score for that, reach mm -hmm. out to you, the mm -hmm. song, um, for the song, or it was something that y'all were actively trying to get into, into a film? Like how does that work for a producer? I, I think it happens, artist? I think it happens um, both ways sometimes. I mm -hmm. think a lot of times, you know, um, music supervisors of film will reach out to you and say, hey, we would like to use this particular content from you. Can we license it from you? Right, right. It can work that way. Or if you pitch it, or if you have a manager that's out here, gotcha. you know, pitching your music for you for film, then it can happen that way as well. Gotcha. That's what's up. 
So being that you have created some um, cla- uh, a lot of the classics and music, I'm sure you can speak to the importance of your royalties and mm-hmm. securing your royalty- royalties and taking care of the business side of things. Um, you got management kind of, I guess, early on for you, maybe. Mm-hmm. But uh, speak to the business part of being a producer and why that is important for you. Um, yeah, I, th- I think that, one, you should have really good people in your corner, good management team, good lawyer, good mm-hmm. accountant, because don't get it wrong, uh, you know, even in my career, there are some, some slip-ups that I made because what happens is, you know, producers, we're typically, producers and songwriters, we're, we're creative, and we exactly. always want to stay creative. Mm-hmm. So we're not really thinking about the business aspect of it, and when you're not thinking about it, things can sort of slip through the cracks. So um, paying attention to, you know, you know, making sure your split sheets and, and, your, and, and what percentage of royalty that you're getting from your content is important and, and not allowing people to totally run your life. I think that's what happens to a, a lot of, um, especially us, you know, black producers. Um, we get so caught up into the, to the hype of what we're doing as creative people. We start seeing that money. We want to flash out, get cars, blah, blah, blah. And that's great. To do that, you deserve that. You deserve to treat yourself to that if you want to, but you got to pay attention to what's going on because as fast as you make that money, as fast as you can lose it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. As an aspiring producer um, that might be listening or artist, when do you think it's necessary to seek management? I think you know. I think sometimes it's premature. A lot of people walk around. I got a manager. Okay, what are they managing? Right. You know what I mean. I think that I think that it's great to have a manager once you start really getting some content. Your record may hit the radio or whatever it is doing. You know what right, I mean. Right. You bring somebody in to help you. Um, you know, ma- manage. manage manager <laughs> manage something for you. And I asked you about uh, the connection you have with an artist or a project and mm-hmm. how that's important for you. Can I ask you which project you might feel most connected to to date or name a project or experience that you just may never forget Whitney Tony Braxton it, you know and I you know I'm, I can't give you just one answer because I've been, I've been fortunate enough to be very connected to a lot of the work and a lot of the people that I worked with mm-hmm. because one I wanted to work with them way before they even knew this mm-hmm. so I, it's almost like my dreams came true right um um, but to be real honest with you, I don't feel like the music industry has even seen the tip of the iceberg when it comes to me. I just think that, um, I think that's what, what the music industry has seen, just the tip of the iceberg. That's how I meant to say that. Gotcha. Um, I don't feel like I've done my best work yet. I don't feel like that. That's but always I, but, a great feeling. Yeah, I, but I'm very fortunate of what I've done. But I feel like there's so much more. more to me to be seen. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, we're looking forward to more. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you once said that anyone can write a song, mm-hmm. but not everyone can produce a classic. Mm-hmm. What do you mean by that? Well, I was taught, um, and I'll mention his name, L.A. Reid. He used to teach us there's a difference between a record and a song. Which one do you want? Mm. A record. You want a record. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So um, there is a formula to writing a record, you know, Um I think you have have uh, components: ear candy, good hook, good verse, and good melody. Mm-hmm. Those those so four ear candies or components would definitely help you have a good record. You have to know how to identify with that, and um, I just think those are good gems to remember when you're composing. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Uh, what's one thing you have to have in the studio when you're creating, whether it be a piece of a equipment or like gear or just maybe like a favorite food i don't know i'm a i'm, I'm a i'm a tech junkie okay. i'm a gear junkie like i love technology i'm always looking for new sounds i'm, I'm probably downloading and buying plugins all the time mm-hmm. even if i'm just playing with them and, 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 and even going back to the question you asked about your sound mm-hmm. i do that to cultivate my sound i believe in um practicing something before it happens mm-hmm. you know what i mean so just like going into film scoring, I, I've been practicing that years. I believe that you, when you when you practice it, the, the universe will bring that opportunity to you. Mm-hmm. So when it goes to, um, you know, your sound and stuff like that, I'm always just messing around with tools and sounds because I know that at some point something is going to come to me, and I want to be able to know how to attack it at that particular point because I've practiced it. Absolutely. What yeah. do you use? Uh, uh, I'm I'm an Ableton junkie right now. I'm I'm kind of like I'm I'm kind of um. I'm like Logic, but uh, but Ableton right now to me is like hands down. Gotcha. Yeah. That's what's up. Yeah. 
So if you could create another record with anyone, um, dead or alive, mm -hmm. who would it be and why? Any, just one person. I know you probably want to work with a lot of people, but... Mm. And you already mentioned Scissor, so she's she's not in there. Wow, that's a good one. Uh, dead or alive? Mm -hmm. Elvis? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I was like, what? Nah. Um, I would I would I would have to say Michael Jackson. I figured. I would have to say that just because. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I think anybody if they could it would definitely. Yeah. 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 That's awesome. Okay, so um, you enjoy the classics, and that's an obvious thing. Like, you know, growing up the type of artists you were listening to. You talk, mentioned Motown. Uh, are you, or what is your opinion on sampling? Is that something that you use often or do often, or are you against it? Not against it at all. Matter of fact, one of my biggest records was Sample Torn. Mm -hmm. That was a um, stylistics record. Mm -hmm. um, I love sampling, and and now with, with the likes of, of, of some of the programs like Ableton and mm -hmm. stuff, like you can chop the samples up and just make a totally different type of record so sampling i think anything that you can find that cr that causes you to be creative and you can turn something into something even greater i'm all for that right i'm all for it definitely i love i love sampling mm -hmm. like some of my favorites are like kanye the way he utilized samples yeah um and even like for real mm -hmm. but uh you scored films and that's what <coughs> we were kind of talking about earlier mm -hmm. and you've even been on the other side of of editing and film mm-hmm and I ran across your Vimeo, like I said. Mm -hmm. And I love the rescore that you did for Thor's trailer. Mm -hmm. um, why film for you? Like, why was that a space that you, you know, you said you practiced it, but like, what was that for you? Like, why did you want to, is it, do you have a love for film or? Mm -hmm. yeah. I always have. Um, you know, even in, even in my early days of being in the music industry, I used to have my video camera. I got, I got so much footage, so many people from Usher to, to just a lot of people. Mm -hmm in the studio, right? That's dope. So that became something to me. I said to myself at that time, I want to just gather all this content. So what happened for me, and I'm a, it's kind of a bit of a story, but what happened That's for cool. me when when I started learning that con that type of content can bring revenue, I was like, okay, I'm, so, I'm, I'm about to start really getting into this thing. So I started filming things and putting my own scores to them, mm -hmm. just practicing it. Um, the other thing too is sometime, hate to say it, R&B for me, I can't speak for other people, R&B for me sometimes keeps you in a box. I don't like to be in a box. I like to be able to explore different sounds, different shapes of music. That's why I do like what's going on in music today because it's, 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 no, box, it's, yeah. it's no box anymore. Um, film allowed me to get outside of that box. You can use different sounds, things of that nature. So if you watch the, the uh, score of film, I mean the Thor um, trailer that I scored <clears throat> that allowed me to just be very very creative with sound mm -hmm. you know what I mean it's not like sometimes it's, it's sometime in music they'll say well I don't like that sound or I don't want to use that sound or that might be too futuristic for this particular song it's not like that with film right. so, you know you can just do whatever you want to do as long as it creates an energy and mood motion yeah. motion well, you're the, good yeah, yeah no that's one thing I noticed with the Thor trailer was that it sounded like it was supposed to be there like I I couldn't think back on what the trailer was so when I saw a rescore I'm like wait mm -hmm. did he just is this not how yeah so, so you pay attention to sound a lot I love I love score like I used to play an instrument so I wanted to you need to listen to my my I did a trailer this year you um, movie Life with Jake Gyllenhaal. Okay. So I did that that trailer, and that trailer was played here in Atlanta, I think California. Sometimes I didn't notice that. So there are different trailers played in different Certain cities. Markets, yeah. yeah. So listen to that one. That one oh. I did my thing with that one. That's what's up. Yeah. I definitely will check it out. I saw some other you know music videos that you, I'm assuming you edited. Mm -hmm. um, it seems to be a lot different than producing for an artist, in my opinion. Uh, working alongside the story. Mm -hmm. So what, what is there a different way you go about working for film than you would when you're like in the studio doing something for an artist? It's kind of the same. Okay. Directing, uh, if you was to sit a director and a producer together, they're the same people, mm -hmm. same thing. Directors have to know how to edit. They 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 they, they got to have to understand sound, motion, editing, all that kind of stuff. So it's kind of the same job. That's true. Really. So what are you working on right now? What's What's currently going on? Right with you? now, basically, I'm reshaping my career as far as just moving towards film. I have a I have an artist development company. 
Um, I don't want to do artist development the typical old school way, you know what I mean? So, um, but I do like developing artists. Um, so I, I'm working on that. I'm opening up a new studio right now. I'm working on that, putting it together. Um, I got out of, to be honest with you, I kind of backed up off of music for a while just to study, just to really study and, and, and retrain my ear to evolve. Because again, I don't, I don't ever want to be one of those producers that's not in tune with what's going on with the generation now and the generation that I come from. Exactly. Yeah, you know, I don't want to be dated. Right. You know what I mean? So I really been really just cultivating my talent, meet, you know, going out. Um, I went overseas, went to Europe, um, went to Japan. My Sweet. whole thing is just trying to create new relationships. Because <clears throat> I think sometimes when you keep the same relationships, a lot of times you, you, you're just, oh, that's just Teddy. You know what I mean? Um, I think a lot of times, sometimes you have to just strike new relationships because they look at you in a different light. Mm -hmm. They look at your talent different. You know what I mean? So that's kind of what I've been doing for myself. That's what's up. Yeah. That's what's up. So I have to ask, because I know you mentioned a few people, a few of your music mentors and the relationships you've cultivated over time. Like, why are those not only fostering new relationships, but even your older relationships important for you as a producer or creative I think, uh, I, moving mean, I think I missed your first half of your question. Was, um, I, I, that's okay. It was a little loaded. Mm -hmm. uh, I was asking, I guess, although you're fostering new relationships, why are the relationships that you've had, like your re reputation and your credibility in the industry, important for um, creating new opportunities moving forward? Mm. Or are they? Uh, yeah, they're 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 important. If if I'm uh, if I'm understanding your question correctly, your question correctly, mm -hmm. um, I'm I just like to forge new relationships, but still still have my old relationships. Yeah, I guess I, I I'm saying in terms of you fostering new relationships is yeah definitely important. But like talk about why you're old or building those relationships from the beginning, like the L.A. Reed, the Chris Hicks mm -hmm. um, that we talked about before. Why were why was building that relationship important, like your foundation? Oh, at that time. At that time, yeah. Oh, be I, um, I just think at that time we were all on the same page, and these were good people. Right. You know what I mean? You know, to me, I can't speak to yeah. for other people, but we had great relationships. Like these people, I still speak to, speak to today. Um, um, I think what happens is that people start taking on their own destination and their own destiny, mm -hmm. and and what happens is you have to do the same thing, and but you still keep those relationships but the the important thing is that you learn from those relationships like what made that relationship good um what what didn't make that relationship good what did you do in that relationship that could have made it better or and you take that and you use it for your next relationship I always look at life as a level of like being in, being in school mm -hmm. like you might be in 11th grade then you got to go to the 12th or whatever the case may be and if you don't learn on the 11th grade level you you're not going to have that wisdom for the 12th grade level so so in answer to your question um those relationships were very important foundations to be able to know how and know how to cultivate future relationships Absolutely. if that answers your question yeah it does it does yeah. that's what i was going for i guess um i wanted to know like because i don't know much about you until today but like mm -hmm. I've never heard anything negative about you so like your reputation and your credibility in the industry uh, for producers you know a lot of people or artists producers have bad rep maybe or people have a, pre a preconceived notion about who they are as people before going in so why mm -hmm. is that important to have a good reputation in the industry and I'm, well, I'm glad you said that um, a lot of times in my career what I've noticed about myself that I think I think I'm a bit of an underrated producer. Yeah, you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. But my reputation, see, what goes around comes around. So what happens is people will start asking about me. Oh, he, that's a good cat right there. He's a good guy. So that makes people want to deal with me because they've been burnt. Real talk. That's what I'm dealing with with a lot of artists that I'm taking on right now. Oh man, they've been burnt so bad. Mm -hmm. So it's, sometimes it's hard for me to convince them that I wouldn't dare do that to you. Got you. You know what I mean? So, but it's hard to convince them of that because they went through the ringer so many times. Mm -hmm. So yes, I want my. I always wanted want my, wanted my reputation to precede me. Like, I heard about you. Yeah, you know, and that makes people feel comfortable with you. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So, uh, I'm glad I was able to do that. 
No, you know, I always tell people today, if you say anything about bad about Teddy Bishop, you just hating on me at that point. Because mm-hmm. I know I've done nothing to anybody but try to influence them and try to help them. That's awesome. Yeah. So who are you, who or what are you most grateful for um, <clears throat> along your journey professionally, like in your career mm. or in life? Who? Who or what are you most grateful for? Um, my mother was definitely a big influence in my life um she passed away in 94 a long time ago big big influence um but yeah i you know people in my life that i come across i i I, um i I, i'm happy of a lot of the people that i've come across some of the people you mentioned in this interview like i'm glad i came across these people because i do believe that i was fortunate enough to meet the right people to help me get my career to a certain level Mm -hmm. you know um um L.A. Reid was definitely a big mentor to me. Mm-hmm. Jimmy Jam was a big mentor to me. Um, certain people that I've just come across um, that just push me, you know. That's that's good. Mm-hmm. And now you're able to push other people, other people, yeah, and get and get some um, cultivation and cultivating artists and things like that as well. Yeah, that's awesome. We talked about all the great music that's out now. I guess I want you to explain the process or the way you listen to music. How do you consume music and what are you looking for? Um, wow, I love to listen to music in the car. Me too. I feel like if music sounds good to me in the car, it's especially good. my own music, mm-hmm. it's going to be just dope anywhere. But when I listen to music, <clears throat> like I was listening to Chris Brown album on the way over here. Mm-hmm. Um, he got this record on there called Everybody Knows About You. Mm-hmm. Love that record, right? Um he got one called Lost and Found. So I'm listening to the I'm listening to these records, right? And I'm just listening to the sonics of it. I'm listening to how it's mixed. Like I'm noticing like a lot of the back a lot of it got these these ghostly vocals going on in the background while they're singing over that. Mm-hmm. That's like the new vibe right mm-hmm. now. You know, sampling vocals then filtering them out and they're just sticking in the background like ghost. That's what I kinda call it. Mm. So I'm listening to that. I'm listening to um, how it was mixed. I'm listening to the space of it from a, from a because I'm a mix engineer. Right. So I'm listening to the space of it and what makes that record punch. You know, I'm listening. To, it's weird. I'm listening all the way down to the hi hat. How the hi hats is spinning. If they 16th or 32nd notes. So I'm doing all this in my brain. I'm dissecting it right. Mm-hmm. And but but while I do that, what's important to me is the lyrics. That's real important to me. See, I come from people who write lyrics for real, for real. And that's why I like SZA. Like, I like her. I like I like her. I like the way she writes. Um, so in answer to that question, I'm kind of dissecting it all the way down to just the, even the space of the record, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? I it think does. any producer or engineer out here that's listening to this will understand where I'm coming from. So that's how for I sure. listen to music. That's, yeah. a, that's a great ear mm-hmm. that you have. Yeah. Have you ever heard a perfect song or perfect record? Uh, and if you have, or if there are more, there's more than one, mm-hmm. can you explain the elements that make it a perfect record mm-hmm. in that song? Um, so what I would do, you know, what, uh, what makes a perfect record to me, is when it's just when it's when it when it glues to my ear when it sounds like glue if that makes sense i know this is weird how i'm explaining it um because even when even when you mix records they have compressions that's called glue you know i mean it it brings everything together Mm -hmm. now i i I used to take the headphones and listen to the thriller album you know and, and listen to how michael jackson's voice would pan from one ear to the next um sonically i'm listening to the sonics I'm listening to the lyrics once again. So these things will make me say, wow, this is just a perfect record. So um, 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 Remember the Times by Michael Jackson was one of them. Um, um, Brandy's back in the day. Um, what's that record she did with Rodney Jerkins? Oh, yeah. That was a hot record to me. Right. Um, I love that song. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh EDM music. Like I love I love what Calvin Harris does. Mm-hmm. You know? Um uh wow, that's a good question. It definitely surrounds you though. Like that's the element that you you feel like the music kind of surrounds mm-hmm. you. It's, and there's different levels of it. Then you have okay, so that that music is very clean to me. Mm-hmm. Then you have your music that's dirt. 
like like Bryson Tiller's record. Right. Like I was listening to his record not too long ago. You know, I go back and listen to his first album, like the record Don't and all that kind of stuff. And real dirty. It's really a dirty mix. But at the same time, it sounds good to me. So in my head, I'll say, this is something I probably did. I probably would have eventually came up with this record. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. But um, if that if that answers the question, I'm, I, I, I pay attention to Sonics a lot. A lot. That's important, I think. Mm-hmm. You know? I think that's what draws you in. Mm-hmm. When, you, when you go to the club, when you hear music, you're paying attention to the Sonics way before you're paying attention to the lyrics. The yeah. lyrics actually hit you later. Yeah. Because half the time, you really don't know what people are saying. That's true. Yeah. All right. So you kind of gave us the idea of what the perfect song sounds like to you and those elements but if you're sitting in a room and there are other producers or other just people in the room do you know consciously that you're going to hear something that they may not hear mm-hmm. yeah and, and that depends on who's sitting in the room that's true you know what i mean it might be a it might be a producer or just a person in the room that has a good ear and we're listening to the same things that actually happened to me what do you listen to? You hear how they made that hi hat do this? Are you listening to that too? You know what I mean? Mm. So or you you hear that how that kick drum is you is is layered. You hear that too. So that depends on who's in the room, but I do know that my experience is making me listen to a record totally different. When you have a hit, when you've had hit records, you listen to records differently because you're constantly trying to come up with another one. And you're saying to yourself, what did I do to for that record to become a hit, whether it be lyrically or sonically, so you try. That's why I said earlier there is a slight formula to to it. To it. So in Teddy Bishop's uh, experience, and as a, a Teddy Bishop record, what elements make your productions unique? The mix. People always love the way I do bass lines. I think that my sound was very. Uh, influential on noontime mm-hmm. you know i think a lot of I, and, and these producers would tell i think a lot of the the, the records sometime that like a brian michael cox would come up i think his he would he would derive from some of my energy and that's fine you know what i mean that just showed me that um that i was an influence mm-hmm. on people so my ba- the way i do bass line my, my, my bass lines were always kind of funky but mellow at the same time so um mood very very moody very dark Almost years ago, before this particular guy did it, I was always, I was, I was about to dub myself as Dark Child, but mm-hmm. Rodney Jerkins beat me to it. <laughs> but because my music can be dark, yeah, you know what I mean. Those so, chords, mm-hmm. yeah, chord yeah. So, um, last thing for me is that what would you tell an aspiring producer listening to this right now? Just at, at this point in their career, they they haven't really hit that that cusp. Mm-hmm. Or even reach the top yet, but they're 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 on their way. I would just say, you know, this the the they have a the the the, the inspiring producer today has a really heavy pro on the con. Um, the pro is music is very global. You can kind of do what you want to do sonically. You can create from a different aspect. You're no longer in this box. Mm-hmm. The con is is so many people doing it right now. You know what I mean? You can go to the Apple store, get you a computer and have a little setup and you're a producer at that point. So my thing is, is to is just to be different, um, be more persistent at what you do and just keep just keep chipping away at it. Don't. And, and, and another thing is don't let anybody tell you what you can't do. Or that's not gonna work. That happened to me so many times. Or that's that's not gonna work. Or you you're not gonna make it. Or that record's not gonna be a hit. You know what, what I mean? you gonna tell them now? Huh? It worked. Yeah. <laughs> it Kiss worked. my ass at this point. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. I take that out. No, you keep it. No, for real. You know, people. A lot of times, you know, p- people. Um, I remember seeing this movie. I hope you don't mind me talking about no, it. I remember please. the Will Smith movie. Um, he was trying to. He was trying to. Will Smith was trying to get to this level of being this uh, accountant. I think it was that Pursuit movie. Pursuit of Happiness. Pursuit of Happiness. Yeah, I love that movie. And it was a. It was a. It was a scene in that movie with his real life son that he was shooting basketball, mm-hmm. and then he was like, "Dad, I want to be a basketball player." He said, "No, nah, you ain't gonna be able to do that, son." And then he walked off. Then he went over to him, and said, "Don't ever let anybody tell you what you can't do, including me." So that was very profound to me when he said that in that film. Mm. So I say that to aspiring producers or songwriters. Don't let people tell you what you can and cannot do because it's going to happen. Um, and, the, and the music industry is very pressurized. pressurized. It'll make you feel like you can't do anything. Um, 
or when the next guy comes along and does something, it'll make you feel insignificant. You know what I mean? No, just keep doing what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Just keep doing it. Eventually, it will happen. I believe if you put pressure on anything, that's just that's just that's physics. You put pressure on anything, what's gonna happen? Eventually, it's gonna, it's gonna break. It's gonna break. Mm -hmm. So just keep doing it. I agree. Mm -hmm. Cool. Well, that was a lot of gems there. I hope that for those aspiring producers, they do take away more I than enough so from this. Um, and we appreciate you sitting down with us talking about what you have coming up and what you've done over the years. Mm -hmm. Very inspiring. Thank Teddy you. Bishop. Yes. Where can they find you um, on social media? Teddy Alexander Bishop on my Instagram. Um, you can go to Icon Music Group, Icon Music Group, Icon Music Group underscore. Mm -hmm. You can go there. Um, you can go to my Twitter page, Teddy, Ale Teddy Bishop. Facebook page, Teddy Bishop. You can Google me. Just Google me. <laughs> and it'll it's come there. up. It will it's definitely there. come up. Yeah, it's there. Including his cool Vimeo. Y'all check out some of those videos yeah. as well. And if y'all want to submit some records to me, you know, get in contact with me that way because I'm working on some really great artists right now. And trust me, they're going to be hot. That's what's up. Trust me on that. I'm excited. Yeah. Well, thank you once again, Teddy, for sitting down with us. As always, you guys can follow me at Sammy Approved. And thank you so much for tuning in to the I Do Music Podcast. We out. Out. Sonic.